Thank you for tuning into the All Funds Investment Podcast. This conversation is with Tony Wise, partner at Cole Freeman and Mellon. We discuss the recent SEC advisor changes and how they affect exempt advisors in particular. Just a reminder here that nothing said is legal, tax, or investment advice. Please check out the full disclaimer below. We hope you enjoy this interview. Please like and subscribe if you find this information helpful and check out the links in the description to connect with us and Tony. So obviously, this is new. It's a new uh, situation here for, for everyone, regardless. So that's an exempt reporting advisor or anybody, right? That's going forward. That's going to be for everybody. Um, yeah. Any feedback from kind of fund managers, that, that initial perception on that, that ruling? Well, yeah, I think a lot of people are still digesting the rule. Um, there's obviously been a lot written about it. There's been podcasts, there's been, um, you know, sort of like industry webinars and such. I think um, we, ha- we well, at our firm, we've definitely had clients reach out and sort of wondering, like, how did these restricted activities rules apply to me? Um, and kind of the simple answer is it is going to apply to you because they apply to everyone. Um, <clears throat> again, there's um, and that's only one aspect of the new rule that applies to all investment advisors. There's also the um, preferential treatment rule that and we can get into that rule uh you know, a little bit later, but that also applies. And we've had clients ask us, you know, for a summary on that. Um, I guess to an earlier point that I was sort of alluding to earlier is like the need for really any of these rules. Um, I mean, my big picture takeaway or at least analysis um, from like a, you know, 10,000 foot view is that Investors here are already accredited investors just by virtue of our regulations here in the United States. So the investors making up like 99.99% of all these private funds are accredited investors who, you know, our government is saying uh, have the means to make these sorts of investments. They can withstand any losses. Typically they have, um, experience and knowledge in financial matters. And this is sort of shown by either like their net worth or their income or their professional experience. If someone is active in the securities industry, perhaps they've passed the series three or the series seven or something like that. Um, You're allowed to invest in, into these funds. You're also allowed to negotiate with your manager specific um, provisions that you might want, like information rights, preferential liquidity terms, lower management fees, all this sorts of thing. And you can get that via side letter. Um, You could get that via establishing a new class of interests um, in whatever fund you're going into. Um, So a lot of the concerns that are supposedly being handled by the new private funds rule, um, they don't, in my mind, really exist because investors already have the power to negotiate for what they want right. uh, to get disclosure of certain items that they, that they would want. Um, and again, a lot of the disclosure requirements here are are already being met by virtue of the fact that they need to be in um, the funds offering documents to start with. So, for example. Fees and expenses has been a uh, sort of historical um, hot button issue for the SEC. Um, For several years now, we've known that any fees that you want to charge the fund, you need to have specifically delineated in your LPA and your uh, private placement memorandum. So you're already getting disclosure. Um, Really no need to have this additional layer of um, after the fact notice of certain fees and expenses. Um, so that's kind of my, you know, high level analysis is that we're not really protecting anyone who already isn't protected or can't fend for themselves. Um, and so again, I'm not really sure, you know, what this rule is, is trying to accomplish there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It can, definitely. It's a kind of a head scratcher, a few different angles there. I guess maybe get into your last point on preferential treatment. Tony, we can go into that and yeah. get your thoughts there as well. That's obviously another one that many people have brought up on my side yeah. as well. Right. So the preferential treatment rule applies again to all investment advisors. It basically says that you can't provide um, preferential um, 
redemption or withdrawal terms um, to uh, an investor if it's going to have a mater material negative impact on the other investors in the fund. Um, and pretty much same goes for providing information rights, um, which are sort of specific to portfolio holdings of the fund. Um, so that's essentially uh, what the rule is. There are a couple of carve outs to that. So if you provide the preferred uh, redemption rights to everyone or information rights to everyone, then you can do it. But then what have you accomplished? Because now everyone's going to be on the same information and um, uh, liquidity terms, essentially. So you're as a manager, you're sort of losing your ability to negotiate with preferred investors, i.e. investors that um, are going to perhaps seed the fund or be like an anchor investor. Um, so you're definitely losing um, some leverage as a manager. And I think it's really important with regards to exempt reporting advisors because, again, exempt reporting advisors are typically emerging managers, so like new startup businesses. And they do need some, some leverage here when they are negotiating with investors. They may want to provide, you know, certain material terms that are preferential, of course, to key investors, but by doing so, they actually are able to launch their business. Um, so I do think that these new rules are going to have a material impact on sort of startup emerging managers. Um, and I guess another point I'll just sort of shoehorn in here as well, <clears throat> and, and I've mentioned this a little bit um, earlier, was the fact um, that side letters can play an important part in um, you know, providing certain investors with pre preferential terms, um, actually getting the manager launched. But essentially, a new manager is going to have to be very careful in what they do inside letters um, because they're going to have to keep track of ev like everything. And this actually leads to the second part of the preferential treatment rules is that um, before you accept a new investor in the fund, you have to provide that new investor um, all material, econ preferential material economic terms. So if you've done a bunch of side letters, you definitely need to keep track of which ones are material economic terms. And then you have to provide that on an ongoing basis to new investors. Um, and then the second part, uh, um, on that is that um, once you do accept that investor into the fund and basically all your um, existing investors, you have to provide all preferential provisions that have been provide, uh, provided to investors and you have to do that on an annual basis. So, um, you know, for some of our larger managers here at the firm who've done a lot of side letters, we'll create sort of like a side letter tracking spreadsheet. Um, and it could be a real mammoth document, right? I mean, I'm talking a spreadsheet, several hundred, maybe thousand, um, uh, you know, rows long by however many columns of different terms. Um, so you're basically going to need to provide that to investors on an ongoing basis. Um, so that's a pretty tremendous task in and of itself. Now imagine having to do that as an emerging manager and, uh, your base in my mind, I don't think you're going to be able to do it really in any practical way. And I've actually been thinking about this. Um, and I think it actually makes most sense to disclose these classes, if, uh, if you will, of preferential terms in the actual offering documents. Um, because you're going to have to disclose them anyway. Right. So why not yeah. just put them in the yeah. offering documents right away? And for certain investors, you might just not offer that class to them, but at least it's already disclosed, right? Well, this, uh, you bring, us, that, that you, makes you bring up an important point, Tony, just about that process. It reminds me of the 40 egg space, actually, where you have different share classes, um, one and basically different thresholds based on, on um, ticket size right do we go down to that road basically and, and the emerging managers create separate share classes with different terms already outlined in the ppm and offering memorandum and disclosed um 
versus trying to put together a bunch of different side letters and push that out to uh, would be new investors coming in, right? It's an interesting situation yeah. to, that you bring up. Right. And, and, and sort of just spitballing here, because um, I haven't really fully fleshed this out, but there's a couple of ways that a fund can offer different classes of interest. And one way is the way we just described, right? You just put everything into the PPM. Another way that has been popular um, over the last several years, really, um, is to have like an addendum. So for example, like a founder's class addendum, which is not full, it's not fully described in the offering documents. It's literally a separate addendum um, apart from the offering documents that you would only provide to those investors that you're offering that class to. Um, and a lot of times these found, founders class addendums or whatever you want to call it, class A addendum or whatever that class is named, once you stop offering it, you literally just throw away the addendum. Um, and then that's it. And what's being offered from that point forward is only what's disclosed in the PPM. Um, you're kind of taking away your ability to do that now with these new rules, because you're going to have to go back after the fact and provide notice of potentially um, material economic terms uh, for prospective investors. And then um, all preferential terms for people who are actually in your fund. So it may take away that practice. I read a few different versions from different law firms, right? <laughs> and uh, it just seems like sometimes like, does, does this apply to everybody or certain confines of like advisors, certain advisors or, you know, disclosures versus. You know, right. Versus yeah. I think um, it's interesting that it, uh, it sort of puts, exempt reporting advisors and advisors that are not registered as right. investment advisors right in some ways on the same playing field as registered investment advisors right um, so while not all the rules of this new private funds rule um apply to uh <clears throat> to all investment advisors uh, a number of them do and you know as an exempt reporting advisor or an emerging manager you kind of have to almost step your compliance game up from day one uh to be in compliance once these rules you know actually right. come into effect because the assumption is well if i'm not registered i don't have to worry about any of this until i am right that's probably the general assumption these days could you could you break down for us like just before we get into it really like what is an exempt advisor versus a non-exempt advisor yeah sure um so if you provide advice as to investment in securities uh, for compensation to someone other than yourself, you are an investment advisor. Um, that means that you need to register with the appropriate regulatory body. <clears throat> um, typically, that's either going to be the SEC or uh, the state that you're in, depending on your assets under management, um, otherwise known as AUM. Um, so it's, it's sort of AUM driven. Um, and also depends on who your clients are. So if you only have private funds, typically you don't need to register with one of those regulatory bodies. Um, if you manage SMAs, then you, then you will, you, you, you will always need to register with one of the bodies. Um, so a lot of our clients only manage private funds. And because of that, they're able to take advantage of either the SEC's, um, private fund advisor exemption or that of their state, again, depending on uh, AUM. When you make your filing as an exempt reporting advisor, you then are, you're, notif notif you're notifying your, um, you know, your appropriate regulator. Um, but then you're typically not subject to most of the rules under the Advisors Act or any like state specific rules that apply to registered investment advisors. Um, so you're, compliance obligations are actually typically relatively light. Um, so there's less that you need to do from a compliance side, like less that you need to keep track of. Um, you typically do not need to uh, engage a specific compliance consultant or a compliance firm. So you're saving on costs and in general just makes your life uh, a lot easier. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. And the, so the, the key topics that I like saw as I, as I went through some of these documents and, you know, feel free to, to add or, or let me know if there's anything that, you know, maybe is not worth covering here. But 
in terms of for exempt advisors. So reporting in terms of statements, there's new rules with audit, compliance, treatment of investors, and then fees. Is there anything that you'd like to add or subtract from that? So I think that is, um, that's obviously encapsulating, I think most of the new rule. Um, and again, uh, the entire rule applies to registered investment advisors. Only parts of the new rule are going to apply to exempt. Um, and specifically those are the restricted activities, um, section of the rule and the preferential treatment, uh, section of the rule. Those are going to apply to everyone, whether you're registered, uh, exempt or otherwise not making any filing because uh, certain states also have self-executing exemptions, which is sort of apart from the exempt reporting advisor uh, regimes. Um, but those are going to apply to everyone. Um, <clears throat> and we can sort of dig in on some of those specific requirements. Uh, but you're correct. With respect to the uh, restricted activities rule, there is a quarterly statements um, portion in which you have to um, provide your fund investors with um, a breakdown uh, at the end of each quarter of the fees and expenses that have been paid uh, specifically with regards to your regulatory uh, and compliance costs. So those specific costs, regu regulatory and compliance, need to be provided quarterly at the end of each quarter um, within 45 days after the, the end of the quarter. That's separate and apart from the quarterly statements rule that applies to just registered investment advisors. Um, that the difference there is, um, that requirement, um, requires that you have a breakdown of all fees and compensation to the manager, um, and other expenses, not just your regulatory, um, and compliance costs. They do follow the same schedule, um, being quarterly and 45 days after the end of each quarter, except for, um, with regards to the rule that only applies to registered investment advisors, that can be um, provided 90 days after the end of the year for, the, for that fourth quarter. Whereas the rule that applies to everyone, including exempt reporting advisors um, with respect to uh, legal and compliance and regulatory costs, that still needs to be provided within 45 days. I'm not really sure why those time periods don't line up, um, but I think that's something that sort of you know, exemplar exemplary of this rule, right? Where um, it would have been easier if this was sort of uh, on the same time schedule, I think, and would have made a little more sense. Um, so again, something that if you read it closely, uh, you can sort of pick out and, and figure out. And as a manager, you can sort of plan for this. Um, but it's just one more thing that you need to uh, pay attention to. Um, again, if you're an exempt reporting advisor, you don't need to provide that uh, statement that provides a breakdown of all fees in compensation to the manager and all the other expenses. Um, but again, just something that you have to pay attention to. Got it. And I think for, like we talked about last week, I think what would be really helpful for this episode is just focusing like specifically on the exempt reporting advisors. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so that was one aspect of the uh, restricted activities rule that I had uh, sort of just described now that, that quarterly statements. Um, another thing that you need to do with regards to the restricted activities rule um, is also provide a quarterly a statement of any clawback that has been reduced um, by taxes to the advisor. So some funds will have a clawback mechanism. It's most commonly seen in like a private equity or venture capital fund such that if the manager receives more carried interest than it's entitled to under the agreements, um, the fund will actually claw back the excess amount. Um, here, however, if you have a provision that allows you to reduce the clawback by um, the amount of taxes that you are now going to owe on that carried interest, you also need to provide a breakdown of that quarterly. It's sort of an after the fact mechanism, <coughs> excuse me, because you're providing these reports at after the end of the quarter. 
So the investor isn't going to know or even be able to consent to this specific amount um, on these reports. They will have consented actually ahead of time um, just by virtue of the fact that uh, the clawback mechanism and the fact that uh, uh, examination and regulatory and compliance costs are going to be charged to the fund. That needs to be disclosed in the fund doc documents. So as a new investor, uh, you're going to be reading these documents and you're going to know that you're going to be responsible for a pro rata portion of these costs. You won't know the actual expense because it wouldn't have been charged yet, <clears throat> typically. Um, but you're going to get a statement after the end of each quarter that sort of breaks this down. Um, I'm not really sure how that in how that helps the investor, because as I just mentioned, they already know by reading the fund docs that they're going to be responsible for these fees and costs. If it's a closed ended fund, that investor, if they don't like the amount of fees that are being charged with respect to these services, um, they're not going to be able to withdraw. So it's kind of a, um, I think, limited benefit to investors. If it's an open-ended fund, you know, they could always choose to walk with their feet and, and redeem um, subject to any lockup period or gates or anything of, of that nature. But I just don't really see how it helps um, the investor at the end of the day. So that was uh, sort of a breakdown of those quarterly reports. And, th and there's a few other restricted activity, uh, restricted activities that uh, you're going to either need to provide notice um, or get investor consent. And we can, we can talk about those as well, if you like. I think that would be good just to kind of break that down for, for folks <clears throat> as well. Absolutely. There are a couple of other um, restricted activities rules, um, aside from the ones that I mentioned, that actually require prior notice, so not after the fact notice, uh, and consent. And uh, the first one is if you're going to, as the manager, borrow from a fund client, um, you would need to give investors notice, all investors notice, um, and then get a majority uh, consent there. <clears throat> um, so this specific one, I think, makes sense because it's really sort of an interested party transaction. It's the manager, you know, is obviously conflicted here. So this makes perfect sense to me. I don't um, have any sort of issue with, with, with this uh, specific one. Um, the other, when, when, I guess, when it when it comes to borrowing, is this like I need to borrow for a down payment in my house, or is this like borrowing for the fund? Uh, I think any, any uh, yes, any situation. Well, it's it's any situation, but more to the former. Uh, so if the manager is borrowing from one fund, I guess we've seen uh, scenarios where a manager asks us, can I borrow uh, funds from one fund to be used on behalf of another fund? So that would be like your uh, clear cut situation here where you'd have to really get um, or provide notice and get consent from investors before doing so. Um, but yeah, I, I actually think that this is a uh, sort of like the the, the shining uh, light here in this rule and, and sort of the, the savior of it a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I, dig, I digress here and uh, we can move on to the other prong um, of the rules that require advance notice and consent. And um, the second one sort of relates back to something I was talking about earlier uh, regarding regulatory and compliance costs. Um, so if there's actually an investigation of you as a manager, um, then before you can charge those fees and costs to the fund, you have to provide notice and again, get a majority and consent, uh, ma a majority consent here of your uh, limited partners. Um, so this is, again, with regards to an investigation. So it's something that goes beyond your standard regulatory uh, and compliance costs, something that's specific to a regulatory or governmental investigation. Yeah. Could, could you give us maybe one or two examples of, you know, what when, when a situation like that might occur? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a registered investment advisor, 
you will get examined. It's sort of just a matter of when, especially if you are a um, SEC registered investment advisor, uh, you will get examined. And that's, I think, pretty typical of the st uh, state registered investment advisors as well. Um, the examination costs and fees itself can be allocated uh, to the fund without consent. Um, and again, relates back to something I was mentioning earlier. But if, say, an investigation emanates out of that examination or um, there's sort of an investigation that starts just um, for another reason, perhaps there was an allegation of fraud or whatnot, and that particular regulator um, you know, thinks that an investigation is warranted, then those specific fees and costs you're going to need to get uh, pr or provide notice and get consent uh, from the fund before charging it to the fund. Um, and then sort of to, to wrap this all up, because um, we've been talking a lot about fees and costs related to regulatory exam, regulatory, governmental or examinations, anything that relates in a sanction. So like, um, you, you know, you're found to have uh, violated the Investment Advisors Act. You can never charge any of those fees and costs to the fund, no matter what the fund documents say, no matter what consent you try to get you're just barred um, per the new private fund rule. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, I'm curious too, just based on allocators and, and size investors, as we talked about, you know, if a larger investor wants to come in, they want a, a better fee, fee uh, economic situation, right? Or better liquidity uh, than, the, than everybody else. But if they were to come in and they do that deal, and then basically everybody else gets the same economic terms, how is that fair to the smaller investor you know, with less the risk reward scenario, right? So I'm curious. Right. I just a couple of conversations I've had with with various various investors. They may not may be separate funds, and they won't allow certain types of investors, you know, coming into that fund. So why why have a investor coming in 100 grand when they're putting in 10 million? Why should the economic terms be the same? So yeah. it'll be interesting well, to see how I, that plays out. Yeah, and and I think to be clear, you don't have to offer those economic terms to the smaller investor, but you do have to disclose them. Right. Um, which is in That's and of itself something as a manager. Yeah, as, as a manager, you wouldn't need to do because that could right. that could turn off the investor, and then they may may not even invest. And you're like, hey, right. but wait a second, it's because they're putting in X yeah. million dollars, and you're not putting you're putting in something less. And right again, um. I do think it's important to note that very large managers, established managers, it's going to be a headache for them to comply with this, but they have the means to do it. Yeah. Um, I think the newer and middle market managers, this presents um, a whole nother challenge to them uh, specifically. And that's kind of, a, to be honest, the, the sort of person and client that, um, that I'm trying to look out for here. Uh, but yeah, you, right. you raise a good point. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. How how details like did, did, when it comes to like these disclosures? It just is it just like as simple as writing into PPM? There's two share classes. This one gets charged one in ten instead of two in twenty. Or are you telling them there's been five investors with fifty million dollars in class one versus class two has two investors with three hundred k? You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think you have to disclose. I think it's more the former. I don't think you have to disclose. Um like the number of investors and how much they invested uh, in the fund or anything like that. But I do think you have to, um, you know, say there is this particular class um, and it offers these specific material economic terms, um, you know, one 0.5% management fee, only 10% performance allocation versus your standard two, two and 20 or something like that. Um, but yeah, these are all really good questions. And I think, sort of how we approach all of this is going to be interesting uh, because I do think it requires a lot of thought um, for for your just your standard offering documents. Um, it, uh, as we've sort of discussed, like if I was a new manager, I would really try to steer clear of the of, of side letters. I think that's going to create a headache. Um, so for steering clear of side letters, that means um, more changes to offering documents themselves. So we're going to have to think about all that. Um, I think the other point I wanted to um, just quickly raise 
again, um, relating to exempt reporting advisors, <clears throat> is that um, as an exempt reporting advisor, you don't really need like a, you know, thick, detailed uh, compliance, uh, uh, you know, policies and procedures, uh, compliance manual. Um, all so all investment advisors are subject to the insider trading rules um, and sort of front running rules. And um, you're actually required per the Advisors Act to have written policies and procedures uh, specific to insider trading. Um, as a registered manager, you have uh, a bunch of other obligations that you need to um, consider and that your compliance manual needs to have in writing. Um, not so the case with uh, exempt reporting advisor. Um, so I, I mentioned insider trading. There's also uh, technically pay to play rules apply to all investment advisors. I don't think you necessarily need to have that in writing, but it's definitely a best practice. Um, and you should also have uh, a section on whistleblower and sort of the manager's um, obligation to comply with the Exchange Act whistleblower rules. So, you know, pretty um, concise compliance uh, manual for exempt reporting advisors. But with these new rules, um, because they apply to you as an exempt reporting advisor, I think, um, you know, these specific managers should consider, you know, uh, putting in their policies and procedures for how they're going to comply with the rule in their compliance manuals. So that's something else that exempt reporting advisors are going to have to do that they in the past would not have had to do. That, that makes sense. And then obviously, you know, obviously the work, you know, the, the tracking and reporting on a quarterly basis, all the other items we talked about earlier, that's going to be pushed mm -hmm. to the operations teams, I'm sure at the fund level or compl separate compliance firms that they're mm -hmm. working with, right? Which also creates additional added costs that the emerging manager wasn't anticipating uh, right. as an ongoing thing that we'll have to do to, to be compliant. Yeah. Or they're going to have to try to do some of this themselves, which right. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that, but I mean, again, um, you know, at our firm, we work with managers from uh, never managed the fund before to uh, billion dollar managers. Um, so we kind of see it all and sort of seeing how this is going to work across the spectrum of manager to me um, makes me or I have a little con uh, concern for these middle market uh, uh, emerging managers. And we're just going to have to coach them up and, and be of service to the best that we can um, to sort of get past these new obligations. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm curious to your point, I mean, how the capital raising process will change given, you know, they have to disclose these certain terms and, and elements up front uh, and how they communicate that to the would be potentially new investor. Um, what impact will that have uh, downstream and how, how, I mean, it's already hard right now to, to raise capital in general, but how, how further that will be taken as we kind of move through this environment. Obviously, there's a lot of things going on right now. There's 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 a counter suit with the SEC, the bunch of firms in the industry regarding this right. these rules. How that's going to affect what it's what, what the resulting determination will be. Um, I'm curious. I don't know if you followed any of that or what, what you've seen with that. Or obviously, it's a lot of speculation at this point as what will happen. But uh, um, yeah, very yeah. interesting times for sure. On the on the fundraising point, I mean, it's not going to help really the fact that you you already need to disclose. Like and I've said this probably five times now, but you need yeah. to disclose in your offering documents all the fees and expenses that are going to be charged. Right. You're going to have to now do that do this with probably even more granularity. Um, and um, you know, it's going to need to say that the fund will charge or will. Um, be responsible for regulatory um, and uh, compliance uh, fees and costs if, if that is indeed the case. Um, but also, and I'm stealing from my colleague, Dave uh, Rothschild here, everyone should listen to his podcast, Tokens of Wisdom, um, on this rule because it's very succinct and, and, and really good. Um, but then you're going to kind of be re repeating the same thing. Like you're also, the fund is also bearing uh, fees and and costs related to disclosure of such fees and costs. Um, so again, that requirement is is more so 
duplicative and more of a, like an annoyance and not something that's necessary because they're already getting disclosure of the fees and costs. Um, right. It's just coming through in a different way. Um, and I'm not a capital account statement expert by any means, um, but I imagine on the investor's capital account statement, um, you know, they're going to see what their balance was at the beginning of the period and what it was at the end of the period. They may not see the specificity and granularity of specific fees and costs, but they can sort of reverse engineer um, what the effect of fees and costs are having on their investment. Um, like, you know what you're, management fee is as an investor. So you can kind of figure it out. Um, and then to your, your second, uh, point there. Yeah. I am aware that there was a lawsuit filed by the managed funds association, I think a a couple weeks ago, and I think some other industry groups, I'm not sure which ones, I think there's probably five or six in total. Um, I'm not really, uh, I'm not really sure what to expect there. I think what I've heard, so far is that it's probably not going to be successful. I have not analyzed that in really any way. Obviously the argument is that the SEC has overstepped its um, authority here in in promulgating and putting these rules forward. Um, Again, without having drilled down on that, I I obviously tend to agree um, because as we've already discussed, the investors that are supposedly trying to be protected are not main street mom and pop investors. They're accredited investors, if not higher. Um, and it applies to all these investors, including your in- super institutional investors who probably have already negotiated for a lot of these things in side letter. So not sure what, what's being accomplished here. Right. And just to remind everybody, Tony, your end is um, next year is when this all starts, right? potentially and if you right so oh yeah so that's a good point um i just saw last thursday that these rules were published in the federal register which um i believe means the effective date is 60 days from last thursday um right. september 14th um so you know two months from from that date they're effective and then there's compliance dates so these are the dates in which you actually need to start adhering to the rules. Um, and they range from either 12 months uh, to 18 months, depending on the size of the manager. And that size breakdown, I believe, is um, 1.5 million AUM attributable to those private funds. So if you're um, a larger manager above that, I believe you have to comply within 12 months. And if you're a smaller manager with probably less resources, um, you have a extra six months. Got it. Well, that's important to Got bring it. up. I guess everybody's gonna have to uh, be talking about this now, initially and ongoing, right? Just from an impact perspective. Yeah. And w- one of the other things that comes to mind, Tony, is you know just the transition from being exempt to non-exempt, or yeah, from being exempt to non-exempt, where you know, is it almost, you know, obviously every manager wants to hit whatever the threshold is, 125 million if they're not already an RIA. Uh, is, is it kind of just from now, like here going forward, kind of just start following these rules from the start? Or is if you don't follow some of the ones that are not applicable to exempt advisors, is that going to cause issues down the line or will you have to, you know, kind of retroactively implement some different things here? So if you're an exempt reporting advisor, I think you really, and you kind of have to gauge when you feel like you're going to no longer be exempt and that you need to register. If your AUM is, you know, really small and let's just throw out a figure, right? You're 25 million assets under management. You're not going to be raising any capital in the foreseeable future and you have no SMA clients, likely you're going to be exempt for a, for a while because you actually have up to $150 million in private fund assets before you need to register. <clears throat> um, so in that case, you really only need to pay attention to the rules that apply to exempt reporting advisors. If you're closer to that, um, that upper limit for private funds, then you probably want to start preparing for that right away um, 
because you could have a really good end end of end of year, and all of a sudden you're sitting at over 150 million um, as a, of your um, you, you, your next uh, um, annual updating amendment for your Form ADV, <clears throat> meaning that you need to register. And at that point, you're going to need to be in compliance. Um, so I think it's a little bit of kind of knowing where you sit and where you expect to be um, and sort of taking it from there. Uh, and also, if you're an exempt reporting advisor, you know, we haven't really discussed the rules that are going to apply um, to all investment advisors. And we want to sort of focus on exempt reporting advisors, but there's the audit requirement that's going to apply to all registered investment advisors. Um, some exempt reporting advisors, just by virtue of filing with a particular state and the type of um, funds that they manage, are already going to need to get an audit. Um, so you kind of need to look at your individualized circumstances. For example, if you're a manager in California and you only manage private funds, but those funds are 3C1 funds, non-venture capital funds, you're already getting an audit. So it kind of doesn't affect you as much as um, some manager who is relying on a self-executing exemption and there is no audit re requirement and you also didn't put an audit in your fund documents. Then you got to start paying attention as you climb up that AUM scale because then you have to factor in the cost of an audit and what that's going to do to uh, fees and expenses and, and fund performance and obviously your compliance obligation. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, there's there's one question I had, Tony, regarding uh, offshore funds, or maybe specifically a lot of digital asset managers have you know, maybe a master feeder, right, with offshore components. Um, if it's domiciled in the U.S. versus the U.S. You know, investors in an offshore CAM or BBI fund, what, what are they? There are some there are some elements that were brought up in this this ruling as well, right, about offshore funds. Can you maybe? Yes. Yeah. 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 So my understanding is that. Um, these rules generally are not going to apply with respect to non-US managers of their non-US funds. Right. Whether the manager is registered, not registered, or avails of, of an exemption. And I think the thinking there is that generally um, these Advisors Act rules and rules under the um, <clears throat> promulgated by the SEC are typically, if there's like no U.S. nexus, so non-U.S. manager, non-U.S. fund, typically they're not going to apply. And that's the way that I understand it here mm -hmm. uh, generally as well. Um, and by non-U.S. manager, I think um, a good way to think about it is that they don't have their principal place of business um, in the United States, um, which is a specific term as well. But essentially, if, if, if you're one of these managers, especially in, in the crypto space, who has no U.S. presence and you're only managing non-U.S. funds, then these rules are not going to apply to you. Got it. OK, that's helpful. Uh, any other questions in your end, Skyler? No, a lot, of, a lot of interesting questions. I'm, I'm sure that everybody has um, being brought up. I guess, Tony, your side, obviously, you're, you're talking to clients now about this as they're launching new funds and making sure they're ready what this looks like for them and specifically existing clients who need to kind of have a review of their current situation, right? So probably the recommendation is for everybody to take a look at this and talking to their, their law firm. Yeah. Their operations I, teams. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I will say that I think everyone, including myself is appreciated, appreciative of the um, sort of extended compliance deadlines here, which I do think makes sense because I think everyone, including the SEC, is probably understanding that this is not like some ministerial, um, these aren't ministerial tasks. It is going to take some time to implement. Um, and I think that will give, you know, law firms, compliance providers and clients and managers alike sort of time to get all their ducks in a row. Um, you know, at our firm, again, I, I mentioned we have emerging manager clients all the way up to the, the billion dollar uh, managers. Um, and a lot of the managers with, you know, higher AUM, they have, um, you know, they're virtually always going to have uh, pretty good compliance consultants, compliance firms engaged. Um, again, 
some of the emerging managers and, and sort of middle market are not going to. And those are the people that are going to have to probably do the most to catch up here. Um, but, and, and a number of my clients are going to fit into that less than 1.5 um, billion uh, AUM with respect to private funds bucket. So they're going to have the 18, the full 18 months, which I think is a good thing. That's going to allow um, them and all their service providers. Cause I, I do think it's going to take coordination from multiple, not just compliance consultants, but um, you know, law firms, admin, because admin's probably going to be helping a lot on quarterly statements and disclosure of fees and whatnot. Right. Um, and other uh, service providers as well to sort of, all come together and provide a sort of coherent, concise solution for a number of these um, obligations. Hundred percent. Yeah, a lot to think about there for sure. Yep, <laughs> definitely. Tony, this this is a great man. Really appreciate you coming in here, uh, giving us the update. Where can people go to connect with you and, and learn more about your company? Yeah, so um, you can go to our website, colefreeman.com. You can find me specifically on our team page uh, under the partners uh, heading. You can also find me on LinkedIn. I think my you can just search for Tony Wise on LinkedIn. You'll definitely find me. Um, I believe my it's backslash Anthony M. Wise, so my full name on that, though, if you wanted to search for me directly. And then I'm also on Twitter. That one is simply at Tony underscore wise underscore Twitter or X. Um, but you'll find me there as well. And getting a little more active on, on X or Twitter, it's funny to say X. Um, but yeah, um, that's where, it's, but LinkedIn is where I do a majority of sort of my posts and, and work there. But um, again, start starting to get uh, Twitter into the fold as well. Sounds great, man. We'll make sure to include all that in the show notes. Thanks again, Tony. Appreciate your time, yep. Tony. Great update. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure to like and subscribe for more content like this and reach out if you're interested in starting a fund, whether it's a hedge fund, VC fund, um, whatever fund you're thinking, uh, we could help you out. And let us know if there's any other topics that you'd like for us to cover. Thanks for watching.